What's up guys? You know, this channel is highly focused on 3D rendering, but someone recently asked me about sprite batching for 2D using OpenGL, so I thought I'll give it a try. In addition, this is a great opportunity to get to know uniform buffer objects, which is a very efficient way to transfer large blocks of data to uniform variables in the shaders. The idea behind sprite batching is that you stack up multiple textures or sprites in the same texture file and you render multiple sprites using a single draw call. In theory, and probably in practice as well, it should be more optimized than storing a sprite texture in a separate file and submitting a single draw call for each sprite. When you want to render a single texture on the entire window, as in this example the background of the demo, the most straightforward way would be to use what is called a full screen quad with NDC position coordinates going from minus 1 by minus 1 at the lower left up to 1 by 1 at the top right. The corresponding texture coordinates in this case will span the entire UV space from 0, 0 to 1 by 1. In sprite batching, every single sprite has a different base in texture space as well as a width and a height. These values are in the range of 0 to 1. So how do we calculate them? Well, it depends on the structure of your sprite sheet. If you have sprites of varying sizes, then you need to get the coordinates from the application that was used to pack the textures. In this case, I got a bunch of free sprites from GameArt2D and used a free online tool that packs multiple sprites into a single sprite sheet. It also generates a JSON file that tells you the coordinates and dimensions of each sprite. The sprites that I used are all of the same size and I also made sure that padding is set to zero to simplify the calculations. This allows me to manually calculate the sprite size in texture space by dividing one by the number of sprites on the vertical and horizontal axes. Then, to get the location of the bottom left corner which serves as the base, we just need to multiply the row and column indices of the sprite by the height and width in texture space, respectively. In general, our vertex shader will need to output two pieces of information, a position in NDC space and a texture coordinate for the fragment shader. The reason that the position will be directly in NDC space is that we are not doing any projection, so we can leave the W as 1 and this will make the perspective division step redundant. We just need to translate from screen space coordinates to NDC, which is very simple. We multiply the pixel position in X and Y by 2, divide by the width or the height and subtract 1. Ok, so how are we going to render multiple sprites at various sizes and at different locations on the window? There can be multiple solutions here, but the one that I came up with is based on a vertex buffer with multiple identical quads. Each quad is basically a normalized square that goes from 0, 0 to 1 by 1. We will initialize this vertex buffer with as many quads as the maximum number of sprites that are going to be displayed simultaneously in a single frame. Ok, cool, but what about the location on the screen and which sprite to match to each quad? Well, this info is going to be stored in uniform arrays. Specifically, we're going to need the following 2D vectors in order to configure each quad. A base position on the screen, the width and height also on the screen, the texture coordinates and the width and height of the sprite in texture space. In order to calculate the output position from the vertex shader, we just need to multiply the vertex position, which is either 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0 or 1, 1, by the width and height of the quad and add it to the base position of the quad. This way, the 0, 0 vertex will be mapped to the bottom left corner of the quad on the actual window, the 1 by 1 vertex will be mapped to the top right corner and etc. Calculating the texture coordinates will be done in the same way. This piece of logic is implemented in the vertex shader. We grab the base position from the uniform and since this is a 2D vector, we extend it to 3D by setting the Z coordinate to a half for all vertices. This is just to make sure that the vertex will not be dropped by the depth test. We take the sprite width and height 2D vector and multiply it by the vector position. When we add that to the base position, we get the vertex location in NDC that corresponds to one of the four corners of the quad. Remember that all values here must be in NDC. We will revisit this point later. The final GL position vector will have one in its W component. You can see that the texture coordinates follow the same logic. The fragment shader doesn't need to do much except sample the color from the sprite sheet, 
and drop background fragments whose color is black. You may be able to achieve the same result using alpha blending, but I didn't have time to try it out. Notice that when we access the uniform arrays, we use a quad ID as the index. This quad ID is actually a vertex attribute that tells us the quad that this vertex belongs to. Otherwise, we won't have a way to differentiate between the quads. So every six vertices make up a single quad, and for every quad, we need to increment the quad ID in the vertex buffer. It would have been nice for GLSL to provide us with a system generated value for the primitive ID because then we could have calculated it ourselves. Each two triangles make a quad. Unfortunately, the primitive ID is available only in the fragment shader, so this is too late. So to recap, we need two attributes per vertex, a position and a quad ID. Side note here, we can also utilize multiple sprite sheets in a single draw call by adding a sampler index to the uniform quad info. This index will be forwarded to the fragment shader, which will access the corresponding texture. All right, in order to handle all this stuff, I created a class called quad array that creates a VAO and a couple of vertex buffers with as many vertices and quad IDs that are required. It populates the vertex buffers with identical quad as we discussed and sets a running index in the quad ID buffer accordingly. It also provides a render function that lets you render a different number of quads each time, up to the maximum. In order to make it easier for the developer to actually use sprite batching, I created a class called sprite batch that manages the interaction between the sprite sheet, the quad array, and the sprite technique that includes the shaders that we just saw. This class takes the sprite sheet as a parameter, as well as the number of sprites on the x and y axis, and the resolution. It loads up the texture, initializes the sprite technique so the main application code doesn't need to mess with it, and does a bunch of calculations that will be needed later during the execution. So, for example, we calculate the sprite width and height in pixel. This will be used in order to calculate the sprite aspect ratio, which is important in order to maintain the appearance of the sprite in different resolutions. We do a similar thing only in texture space. We also calculate the size of each pixel in NDC space so that we can calculate the size of the entire sprite in NDC. The advantage of using this class is that the main application code can continue working in screen space coordinates and the sprite batch class translates everything to NDC while keeping the aspect ratio of the sprite. So we have a render function that takes a vector of sprites that we want to draw. For each sprite, we specify the bottom left corner on the window, the location of the sprite itself inside the sprite sheet, and the width of the sprite on the screen. The height will be automatically calculated based on the sprite aspect ratio. In the implementation of this function, we translate the screen space coordinates to NDC, calculate the sprite width and height in NDC, the bottom left corner in texture space, and we use the width and height in texture space which was previously calculated during the initialization. This design makes it very easy to implement a simple animation that switches between different sprites. We just need to play with the sprite row and column indices as we move the base position of the sprite. Now you may be wondering about the efficiency of using uniform variables this way. We already know that for uniform arrays, we need to get the location of each specific element in the array. Isn't this a huge overhead? And what about the size limitations? For each sprite on the screen, we're going to need 4 vectors of 2 floats, so a total of 8 floats per sprite. When I query the maximum number of uniform components on my machine, I get 4k, which means that I'm limited to 512 sprites. If this is enough, then fine, but we can break this limit by using uniform buffer objects, which will also allow a more efficient way of loading data from the application to the uniform variables. The idea is very simple. Instead of accessing each uniform variable as an individual float or vector, we can define a uniform block with multiple variables and use a buffer as a backing store for this block. The block is basically like a structure in C. Once we set the layout correctly, we can load large amounts of data into the GPU using a single OpenGL function call. This is very similar in principle to vertex buffers. Let's see how to set it up. We start in the shader, in this case the vertex shader, where we create a uniform block called quad info with an array of 2D vectors for each piece of information that we need. 
Each sprite has one element in each array. Notice that we can access the members of the block directly, so we don't need to go through the block name. The name is required only for the application code where we need to start by querying for the block index. This index will be used as a handle to identify the block. We get the index using gl get uniform block index with the program handle and the name of the block as parameters. Next, we need to establish a connection between the block index and a binding point. This is somewhat confusing, so take a look at the following diagram. We have a shader with two uniform blocks with indices 0 and 1. On the right hand side, we have a couple of buffers that we want to connect to these blocks. This connection is done using an array of binding points. Each buffer will be bound to a different binding point, and then each block index will also be bound to one of the binding points, establishing a connection from the block all the way to the buffer. Think of the binding point array as a simple list of indices from 0 up to the maximum on the platform minus 1. The maximum can be queried using glGetIntegerV with glMaxUniformBufferBindings. On my machine I get 84, which is a somewhat unusual number I must say. We can have more shaders, more uniform blocks, and more buffers in this scheme. We can even share buffers between different blocks and different shaders. So binding points are very similar to what we have with textures. GeoTexture 0, GeoTexture 1, and etc. Except that instead of a GL macro, we use a simple index. The next step is to get the size of the uniform block in bytes. We call GL get active uniform block IV, passing in the shader program, the block index, a macro that indicates what we need, in this case GL uniform block data size, and an address of an integer for the result. We can now allocate a regular memory buffer using malloc. We will populate this buffer with all the uniform data and upload it to the GPU in a single call. We now need to understand the layout of the uniform block in memory, and we start by querying the indices of the block elements. This is done using glGetUniformIndices that takes an array of the elements' names, the size of the array, and an address of an array to get the results. These indices can now be used to query the offset of each element using glGetActiveUniformIV. In my implementation, the offsets are stored in a class member because we're going to add the quads one by one. The last step in the initialization is to create a buffer using glGenBuffers. If we go back to the previous class, you can see that we translate window coordinates to NDC and we call setQuad on the sprite technique for each quad using a running index. Inside setQuad, we use the offsets to get the base address of each element in the uniform block. Since each element is actually an array of vectors, we use the index to update the corresponding slot in the array with the quad info. Note that at this stage we are still updating a standard CPU memory buffer. Once the buffer has been entirely populated, the expectation is that the user of the class will call update program, which will bind the uniform buffer to the GL uniform buffer target, then GL buffer data to upload the memory buffer into the GPU, and finally GL bind buffer base to bind the buffer to the same binding point that we used when we called GL uniform block binding to connect the binding point on the uniform block side. Alright, this was my first attempt at this topic, so it might not be the most optimized one. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Another optimization that you may want to explore is to move the screen space to NDC calculations down to the vertex shader. This will reduce the load on the CPU and will be done in parallel on the GPU. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you in the next tutorial.